Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Tracy Smith, the Collaboration, Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Center for Integrated Cellular Analysis here in New York City. And in this seminar series, we highlight new papers and methods from our center that we believe to be of interest to the broader community. But today we're going to hear from two speakers who will discuss their recent manuscripts, both utilizing easy sci RNA, a powerful and highly optimized technology that en enables the preparation of 1 million single cell RNA-seq libraries for just $700 using combinatorial indexing. We'll have time at the end of each talk for questions, and we encourage you to either raise your hand and I'll ask you to unmute yourself, or you can type your question into the chat and I'll read it aloud to the speaker. Our first guest today is Zayu Lu, a PhD student at the Rockefeller University in the Cow Lab. His research has focused on developing new single cell genomics tools for understanding cell temporal dynamics and changes during aging and aging related disorders. And our second speaker, Dr. Andras Siraki, is also a graduate student in the Cow Lab. Andras received his MD from the Semmelweis University in Budapest, Hungary. During his studies, he collaborated with Harvard Medical School to study DNA methylation changes in aging mice. He's now working on developing novel, high throughput, low cost, single cell genomic technologies. Andras, would you like to start us off? Sure, I can do that. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to present here. Um, and thank you for the invitation, uh, the introduction as well. My name is Andras Siraki. And I'm a graduate student in Junior Cows Lab at the Rockefeller University. And I'm excited to talk about our recent preprint where we took a global view of aging and Alzheimer's pathogenesis associated cell population dynamics and molecular signatures in both the human and the mouse brains. So why, why do we need single cell techniques? We know that um, different tissues and organs consist of a diverse array of different cell types and aging and disease can affect these distinct cell types differently. Traditional RNA-seq methods weren't able to recover these cell type specific contributions. And the promise of the single cell technology is that we will get this resolution. And probably the most important question of our lab, why do we need better new techniques since there are many existing techniques already, some of them is even commercialized. And the, and the answer lies in the numbers. For example, uh, if we want to study um, the nervous system, the mouse nervous system consists of 10 to the 8 cells, or the human 10 to the 11. With today's methods, we can routinely profile maybe a few hundred thousand cells, but these data sets usually consist of multiple samples, and it's rare to get more than 10 to the uh, 4 cells per sample. And with this resolution, we simply don't have a representative picture of these tissues and organs. And another uh, connected issue is that single cell sequencing today is just very expensive. For example, if we want to profile uh, 1 million cells using the commercial 10x platform, we would pay over $300,000 for library preparation, then additional $18,000 uh, for the sequencing. And with this cost, it's uh, frequently prohibitive to really routinely profile um, multiple millions of cells. So we decided to uh, develop a new method, and we heavily relied on um, a previous method called SkyRNA-Sec3, developed by my PI Jun, as well as generally the combinatorial indexing framework. So in combinatorial indexing, the cells or the nuclei are first extracted, then they are distributed on 96 well plates, and every well will receive a well-specific barcode. Then the cells are pulled and redistributed again. They again get a well-specific barcode. And after multiple rounds of uh, pooling and redistribution, at the end, every cell will have a unique combination of molecular barcodes we can use to recover the cells from the uh, pooled sequencing data. So the method we developed is called EasySky. And in EasySky, after an optimized nuclei extraction and fixation step, the nuclei are distributed in 96 web plates. And the first level of barcodes are introduced by reverse transcription. Here we use two different RT primers, one of them targeting the three end of the genes, the poly -A -tail, and we have a second one which has a random hexamer sequence. This can potentially target uh, 
the entire gene body. And the two primers have different barcodes, so we can uh, separate them downstream computationally. And then I will explain in a bit why these two different RT primers are important and useful for us. Um, but the second level of barcodes are introduced by an optimized ligation reaction, and the third one by PCR. And then finally, we have a custom computational pipeline to get our SERPER gene matrix. So one of the biggest advantages of this method is that it's very cheap. It costs around $700 to prepare the library for 1 million cells. This is around 500 times cheaper than the commercial 10x method and significantly cheaper compared to multiple um, competitor methods as well. And with this price, um, the library preparation is a relatively small fraction compared to the sequencing cost, which is the, uh, the bulk of the cost um, with this method. Another advantage is that we have an overall better gene body coverage. So most of the high throughput methods, for example, 10x has a very strong uh, 3N bias because they target the poly -A tail. But we have these two different RT primers, one of them again targeting the 3N, but the other one potentially targets the entire gene body. And this together gives us a better gene body coverage, which, which we can potentially use to recover isoform or axon level information. And then finally, we have a slightly better performance than uh, in terms of sensitivity uh, compared to the 10x method, which was previously regarded as one of the most sensitive methods. So after we developed this method, EasySky, we wanted to uh, study aging and Alzheimer's disease. And to do this, um, we had five different um, mice groups, overall 20 mice. To study aging, we had three, six, and 21 months old mice. And to study Alzheimer's disease, we use two different models. One of them is the 5x FED model, which is a very well-established um, Alzheimer's disease model. It models early onset Alzheimer's disease with mutations in the APP and the PCE1 gene genes. On the other hand, we also used another model. Uh, this is a novel model. It has the APOE allele 4 and a specific point mutation in the TREM2 genes. Um, these two mutations are the two highest risk factors of late onset Alzheimer's disease. And it, this model is uh, aiming to solve one of the biggest problem of this field that we simply don't have a good model for late onset Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, this is a very novel model and we don't know too much about it, including if there is any Alzheimer's disease like phenotype uh, in these mice. So using our method, we recovered around 1.5 million single cell transcriptomic profiles as well as a little bit less than 400,000 single cell chromatin accessibility profiles using our company method, EasySky ATAC. So after clustering and cell annotation, we recovered 31 main cell types. Uh, the most common one was the cerebellum granuloneurons. We also recovered uh, many expected cell types like astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, as well as a very diverse array of different neuronal cell types and some very rare cell types as well, which were present in less than 0.01% of the total um, cell population, for example, pituitary cells or inferior oligorinoclaus neurons. And then we use this annotated um, single cell RNA sec uh, data set to annotate uh, our ATEC sec data set as well using a deep learning based model. And we got an overall good correlation between the marker gene expression and the marker gene uh, gene body accessibility, as well as the, in terms of the uh, good correlation between the uh, proportion of recovered cells per main cell type across the two molecular layers. So when we did this initial uh, annotation, we also wanted to make sure that this is uh, indeed correct. And to validate these results, uh, we projected our single cell data to a publicly available spatial transcriptomics data set using a non-negative non D-square space method. And we can see here, for example, the olfactory bulb neurons all map to the olfactory bulb or the cortical projection neurons all to the cortex, the striatal neurons to the striatum and the cerebellum specific cell types to the cerebellum and so on, validating the correctness of our uh, cell type annotation. And then after we did this, we also wanted to do one more layer of clustering because we had a lot of cells. We, here we took out every main cell type and we reclustered them. And our goal was to detect uh, potentially interesting subcellular states, uh, which could contribute to aging or Alzheimer's disease. And to do this, we compared two different methods. 
we reclustered re them based on either only the, the gene expression matrix or both the gene and the axon expression matrix, because here we got the axon data because we had this better uh, gene body coverage. And what we found is that if you use both genes and axons, we can separate these clusters better and we can detect more subclusters. And this is po potentially true uh, and can be done because there are uh, specific isoforms, which might be specific to certain subclusters or subcellular states. And uh, the exon expression data can capture these isoforms and it can help our clustering algorithm to identify these uh, smaller subclusters. For example, this is a rare myeloid cell type here, what we detected. So using this uh, algorithm, uh, we found overall 359 uh, subclusters. Some of them are very rare, consisting only a few dozen of cells. And the first question was, are these subclusters really real? Can we annotate them? Um, and we started with some of the rarest um, cell types. For example, uh, this one, choroid plexus epithelial cell subcluster, and this vascular leptomeningeal cell subcluster. And they all nicely separated on the UMAP. They had a unique marker gene profile. And based on these marker genes, we were able to annotate these as the rare pinealocytes or the rare tunicides. And then we used our spatial mapping algorithm again to validate this. And we could see here that the pinealocytes all map to the region of the pineal gland and the tunicides to the bottom of the third ventricle where they are located. Um, and we were able to validate with the spatial mapping uh, this cell type annotation. We also found other rare cell types, for example, uh, proliferating cells across multiple main cell types. And what's very interesting here is that when we map these to the spatial data, they mostly clustered around the subventricular zone, which is the region of adult neurogenesis. And although this uh, marker gene-based uh, method worked fine for certain subclusters. There were other, also other uh, occasions, for example, here in the cortical projection neurons, uh, where we couldn't really uh, annotate these different subclusters based on marker genes. And here, when we did our spatial mapping again, this time with the cell to location software, we found that distinct um, subclusters of the cortical projection neurons map to different layers of the cortex or distinct anatomical locations. And similarly, in the astrocytes, certain astro astrocyte subclusters either map to the olfactory bulb, the striatum, the cortex, the hippocampus, the midbrain, or the hindbrain. So I, I hope I was able to convince you that at least some of these subclusters are real. They might correspond to either distinct anatomical locations or rare cell types or uh, subcellular states. And one of our main goal with this study was to see how cell populations change uh, in aging and Alzheimer's disease. And first we compared the six to three months old mice. Uh, this represents kind of an early adulthood. Uh, and I'm showing the cell proportional changes here uh, at the main cell type level. And what we can see is that the main cells are actually, main cell types are actually very stable. Uh, which is actually one of the advantage of this design because we use the entire brain and we were able to get rid of any region specific biases and get very um, like uh, st very um, stable cell populations here. But we also got certain other uh, main cell types which strongly expanded uh, a four to six time expansion uh, between these ages. For example, these olfactory bulb neurons here. And this correspond to the known expansion of the olfactory bulb uh, between these time points. What was also really interesting here is that when we uh, put the subclusters on this plot, we can detect certain subclusters, for example, these astrocytes here or vascular leptomeningeal cells, which expand um, four to eight times during these time periods. Meanwhile, the main cell type is actually pretty stable. And when we looked into this two strongest change, uh, we were able to map these both of these subclusters to the olfactory bulb. And based on the marker gene profiles, we found that this vascular leptomeningeal cell subcluster is probably the rare olfactory and sheeting cells, which supports the neuronal and axonal growth here in the olfactory bulb. And these astrocytes, based on the marker genes, probably contribute to clearing up the uh, apoptotic cell debris as a result of the fast growth in the olfactory bulb between um, three and six months. 
when we looked into the aging, we compared uh, the 21 months to the six months old mice, and we overall got a very similar picture. The, the main cell types are very stable. They don't change too much, but we were able to find specific subclusters, uh, which again expanded uh, four to six times during aging, even though the main cell type was pretty stable. Um, first, we looked into one the strongest change, which was this microglia subpopulation which can be validated uh, in both molecular layers in the RNA and the ATEXAC data. And based on the marker genes, uh, we found that these are the previously described uh, disease-associated microglias, which will probably contribute to the clearance of the amyloid beta plaques in the brain. And it's known that these disease-associated microglias expand in aging, they expand in Alzheimer's disease, but what's interesting here is that the original studies, uh, what identified these dams, first sorted out just the immune cells from immune cells from the brain, and then did single cell study to identify these. Here we were able to find these disease-associated microglia from the global brain, which emphasizes the importance of large data sets because slowly we are getting to the resolution when we can really pick up these rare but important cell types which might contribute to aging or or disease. Similarly, the, the second strongest change we detected here was also reactive cell type, these reactive oligodendrocytes. Uh, one of the strongest marker gene here is the C4B. Uh, these C4B positive oligodendrocytes were also previously described to be located close to amyloid beta plaques. They can, the C4B is known to recruit microglia and increase inflammation in the brain. Um, and again, the expansion of these uh, oligodendrocytes can be validated in both molecular layers. Uh, and having both level of the data also helps us to identify uh, important transcription factors, which contribute to the activation of these reactive cell types. Uh, to do this, um, we use both transcription factor expression and motif accessibility. We were able to identify a transcription factor, STAT3, um, which contributes to the activation of these reactive oligodendrocytes. We also used um, spatial data to um, validate these results. Uh, and, and we can see here the, the increasing um, marker gene expression in the H brain versus the adult brain. And what's furthermore interesting here is that the, the region where these marker genes are increasing is the subventricular zone, um, the region of adult neurogenesis, where it seems like there is this inflammatory response uh, during aging. And, and this is especially interesting to overlap with another result we found, is that there is overall a strong decrease of multiple progenitor and precursor cells uh, from neuronal and glial cell types during aging. And it's interesting to speculate that maybe the two has something to do with each other, this increased inflammation and this decreasing in the subventricular zone and the decreasing uh, progenitor cells during aging. So with this, I would like to switch to the second part where we studied Alzheimer's disease. And we had these two different models. We had the early onset model, uh, the 5XFAD, which is very well known. And we had this late onset model, this APOI allele 4 tram 2 model, which is very novel, but we don't really know too much about it. And the, the first question was, can we find anything Alzheimer's disease like um, in these late onset model mice? And uh, to investigate this, we took out every subcluster, which showed a significant change at least in one of the models. And what we found is that there was a relatively good correlation between the cell proportional changes of these subclusters between the two models. This was especially interesting because they contain completely uh, different mutations in different genes, and they are only three months old. Uh, furthermore, we also found uh, 560 genes which were differentially expressed um, in, in the same subcluster. And the, and, it seemed, and the correlation of these genes between the two models are very high. Almost all of them are either increasing or decreasing in the same subcluster across the two models. Um, so th this could be some clue that there is something Alzheimer's disease-like happening uh, in this late onset model as early as three months on the uh, cell population dynamics or uh, in a subset in the molecular layer as well. Some of the strongest changes uh, we were able to detect in the 
choroid plexus epithelial cell in a subcluster of them, which have strong marker genes, where the marker genes are all mitochondrial genes, uh, including this mitochondrial uh, ribosomal RNA, which was previously described to uh, suppre suppress AD-related neurotoxicity. And we tried to validate these results with spatial transcriptomics data as well. Um, they indeed decrease in the 5XFED model compared to the Y type. And the original location is the lateral ventricle or around the subventricular zone, where it seems like this potentially protective um, cell, cell subcluster is disappearing um, in the Alzheimer's disease model. And one of the other very consistent change is this inter and midbrain neurons, which increase uh, in both, in both uh, Alzheimer's disease models. Um, one of the marker genes here is actually known to uh, facilitate both intracellular aggregation and extracellular matrix deposition of amyloid beta. Uh, this can be validated again with spatial transcriptomics data. And we were able to locate that these inter and midbrain neurons probably uh, are located in the thalamus and they increase in the uh, 5XFAD model based on the spatial data as well. On the other hand, of course, there are also subclusters which are just not consistent between the two models. Um, probably the best example are these microglia subtype. These are the disease associated microglia as I introduced before. These go up in the early onset model, but don't change uh, in the late onset model. And here we have a few different hypotheses why this is happening. Uh, it's either just like in the late onset model, there is not really an amyloid beta deposition or at least not as early as three months. And that's why they don't go up. Um, another alternative hypothesis is that we know that um, this uh, late onset model contains mutations in the APOE and the TREM2 genes. And both of them are known to contribute to the activation of these reactive microglia. So it's kind of interesting to speculate that maybe these reactive microglia just can't really activate here because of these mutations, but this could be an interesting future direction to look into it. And again, we utilized our two molecular layers and we identified uh, transcription factors, which are important in the activation of these disease associated microglia. Um, some are corresponding to oxidative stress, the NF kappa B signaling, uh, or cholesterol homeostasis. And then finally, we also wanted to uh, investigate if we can find any conserved AD pathogenesis associated gene expression signatures from human brains. And to do this, we created a separate data set um, of 120,000 uh, nuclei from human Alzheimer's disease samples, six uh, AD patients, and six uh, control samples. And we recovered certain different uh, main cell types from two brain regions, from the hippocampus and the superior and middle temporal gyrus. And when we looked into the differentially expressed genes in these two regions, what we found is that a lot of them are strongly region specific. They are either differentially expressed in the hippocampus or the temporal gyrus, or there is a, on the, on the other hand, there's also a smaller subset of genes which are shared between uh, the two regions. And finally, we were also able to find genes which uh, are either upregulated or downregulated across multiple clusters, and they change in the same direction, both in the human samples and the, the mouse models. For example, these heat shock proteins, which go up in both the hippocampus and the 5X FAD model. And this is probably a, a compensatory mechanism against the, the toxic oligomeric assemblies here. Uh, on the other hand, we also found two genes which decrease uh, in the temporal gyrus and the 5X FAD model. Uh, PLP1 was previously identified as a subtype specific driver of Alzheimer's disease. While PD, PDE10A uh, is a known neuroprotective gene, and the decrease of gene is detected in multiple neurodegenerative diseases from uh, Huntington to Parkinson's disease. So, to summarize, uh, we created this new model uh, called Easy Sky. Um, it it costs less than $1,000 to prepare the library for 1 million cells. It has an increased gene body coverage. We recovered many rare and region-specific subtypes. Uh, we identified aging and Alzheimer's disease-associated cell population dynamics, as well as an overall Alzheimer's disease-like signature in the novel late onset model. And we also identified a few conserved signatures between human Alzheimer's disease 
and mouse models. And although here we showed that our method works in both mice and humans, our human data set also only contained 120,000 cells. And in the future, we would like to expand this because we recognize that mouse models are just not the best way to study human Alzheimer's disease. And we would like to create large uh, human Alzheimer's disease atlases to learn about this disease from human samples. And with this, I would like to say thank you to the entire Cow Lab, uh, especially Jun. Uh, for his amazing mentorship, uh, Gabor and Ziu, who created and analyzed the ATEXEC part of this project, as well as to Jasper, who helped me create Easy Sky, uh, as well as to our uh, collaborators and our funding partners. And um, so you mentioned at the beginning, we have a new preprint uh, online, and there are further details. I just didn't really have time here to introduce. So please feel free to have a look at it if you are interested. Um, so thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the questions. Great, thank you so much uh, for sharing your work with us. And we will move on to our Q&A. If anyone would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand or type your question into the chat box. Um, and we do have a question here to start with. So uh, the question is, EasySci RNA-Seq, can this technology be applied for large scale mRNA-Seq for bulk cell culture? like? 100 by 96 wild cell culture plates in an arrayed screen. Yeah, I, I think it can definitely. It works very well in cell cultures. Actually, the, the cell culture signal we get is usually higher than the tissues. Um, so I, I don't see a reason why this wouldn't be applicable. I think it would be even easier to use than, than real tissues, where like we usually uh, get lower signal than in, in cell cultures. OK. Um, and another question, is EasySci compatible with long read full-length cDNA sequencing? It's a, it's a great question. I, as far as I know, in long read sequencing, you don't really have a PCR step, and we have that here. Um, I think it's not really readily compatible, but I think we could try to, to modify to make it compatible with long read sequencing as well. Yeah. OK. Uh, well, I think let's um, thank you so much for that. Um, we will. Uh, oh, we'll take we'll take one more question. One more question here. Does the random primer which compensates poly A contain a UMI, and how can you tell they're from the same cell? Yeah, so um, both of them contain a UMI, uh, which we use to uh, try to remove duplicates. Um, we can tell that they are from the same cell because we know exactly what uh, barcode sequence we put in each well. And they are always the same at the uh, at the same well in the first level of the RT reaction. So we basically have a one-to-one -one matching. We know that if the ligation barcode and the PCR barcode is the same, and the RT barcode matches uh, based on a table we have, then that those reads are coming from the same cell, but from the two RT primers. Well, thank you, and um, uh, thank you for your questions in the chat. Uh, maybe Andros will have a chance to answer them. But um, let's shift on over to uh, Ziyu. Great. Hi, everyone. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Zi Yu. I'm a graduate student at CalLab for Rockefeller University. And today I'm very excited to share you this recent work, a comprehensive view of cell test specific temporal dynamics in human and mouse brains. So the mammalian brains consist of a huge diversity of many different cell types where they maintain a relatively stable composition to ensure the overall size and function of the entire organ. However, if we zoom in to this stable cell population, cells are constantly replacing each other by a delicate balance of proliferation, differentiation, and cell death. And this regulation of these dynamic processes can result in diseases like cancer and aging-related disorders. For example, it has been known that along the aging process, there is a decline of cell renewal accompanied by the increase of cellular synthesis and apoptosis. However, previous study to previous approaches to study this question have certain limitations. They either rely on low super microscopy 
which depends on proxy markers or are based on bulk assets where the cell heterogeneity is masked. In addition, most of the previous study are focused only on mRNA or protein level where the epigenetic regulators is less understood. So in this project, we hope to make a new single cell based technique that allows us to record cell type specific proliferation and differentiation events. And we will use that to study the cell population temporal dynamic changes along the aging process. So the way how we do single cell sequencing in the lab as Andrew just introduced is through the uh, single cell combinatorial indexing. For example, in this uh, most updated version, uh, easy sky that Andrew just introduced, cells will undergo three rounds of indexing and finally, each cell will get a unique barcode based on each round of barcoding. We apply this method to profile around 1.5 million cells of the mammalian brain. And this is great. We can identify so many different cell types, but one limitation is that it only captures static snapshot of the entire population and does not resolve temporal dynamic information. Uh, specifically, we cannot see cell proliferation or differentiation at the main cluster level because they are overwhelming, overwhelmed by the end differentiated cells. In addition, we don't know how, like, which cells are newly generated or which cells has been there in the population for a long time. So to solve this problem, we try to introduce EDO labeling to tag cell proliferation into the SCSI platform. EDO is a assignment analog that can be incorporated into the newly synthesized DNA upon cell division. And due to, because it's low, uh, high stability and low toxicity, it can not only be used to tag cell proliferation, but can allow us to check cell differentiation in a longer time window. So in this method, uh, we name check a scar, we'll combine EDO labeling and the Sky and Sky Ataxic to study cell temporal dynamics in vivo. And here I would like to thank Melissa. She made a great contribution to this project. So this is, oh, sorry, this is the Checker Sky workflow. We started with white time mice of three different age groups, young, adult, and age. And we also include a 5F80 mutant mice that mimic many phenotypes of human Alzheimer's diseases. And we perform into injection for three to five days, harvested the brains, extracted the nuclear, and performed the click IT tagging. At this click IT tagging steps, uh, the EDO label cell will be tagged to an ADAC containing fluorophore through click chemistry. And we can use facts to enrich this idiopathic cell to, uh, from the global cell population and will follow up with RNA-seq and taxi to check that proliferation differentiation by combinatorial indexing. And we extensively optimize the experimental condition to make sure that the previous procedures does not affect the single cell purity and data quality of the resulting uh, profiling. So we final, finally set up in the finalized protocol. And once we get the protocol, the first question I hope to answer is, uh, what cells are proliferating in the developed mammalian brains? So we combine cells profiled by RNA-seq and ATAC-seq, perform the clustering analysis and annotated the cells based on the markers. We identify many different cell types, including two continuous trajectory, the oligodendrogenesis and the neurogenesis trajectory. In addition, we recover cells from mature neuron, microglia, some immune cells, and some vascular cells. We compute the fraction of each cell type with and without enduring enrichment, and we observed a dramatically different distributions. Uh, for example, on the left, cells without EDO enrichment are dominated by mature neurons like cerebral and granular neurons or and differentiated glial cells like myelin forming oligodendrous cells. On the contrary, the idiopathic cells show a strong enrichment of early progenitor states like the neuronal progenitor cell, oligodendrous cell progenitor cells, as well as some immature cell intermediate cell stage like olfactory bulb neural blasts, dentate gyro neural blasts, and the committee oligodendrous cell precursors. As a further illustration, we integrate cells profiled by uh, integrated all brain cells profiled using easy sky and epi as well as idiopoxic cell profiled using tracker scan. 
and this is the integration result. Although the deputy singlets profile using tracker sky is like overlapping pretty well with the Auburn cell from easy sky, the idiopathic cells are only present in a certain proliferating active clusters, like for example, microglia, neurogenesis, and oligodendrogenesis related cells. And this is very interesting. Uh, in addition, because the idiopathic cell is enriched in the intermediate stage. And we can find that through the help of the tracker sky data set, distinct cell types are readily connected and cell, continuous cell trajectory are formed. For example, these neuronal progenitor cells readily connect astrocytes and the OB neurons from the easy sky data set. And the intermediate oligodendrocyte precursors also connected the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells to the mature oligodendrocytes. This highlights the uniqueness of the tracker sky data sets that it is enriched in the intermediate stage that is, uh, which is less represented in the global profiling and can facilitate the identification of continuous cell transition and cell differentiation trajectories. And then we look at into the molecular signatures of each newborn cell types by differential gene expression analysis and as you can see from the heat map, each newborn cell is marked by unique gene expression programs. Although, and this program is supported by both gene expression and promoter accessibility. Although many of these markers are known markers for the corresponding cell type, we also observe some novel gene markers. For example, this gene PRDM8 is enriched in both gene expression and promoter accessibility of the dentic gyrant neuroblast, suggesting its potential play an important role in the dentic gyrant neurogenesis. So in the first part, I've shown you how we can use tracker scan to recover rare newborn cells in the developed mammalian breast and how each newborn cell type is marked by a unique gene expression progress. And the second question we hope to answer is, can we use two molecular layers to gain more insight into the epigenetic regulators of the newborn cells. Specifically, we are very interested in linking six regulatory elements to their putative target genes, as well as identifying transcription factors that are associated with lineage determinations. So we perform this for an analysis. Due to the sparsity of single cell data, we first perform k-mean clustering to aggregate cells adjacent, adjacent to each other on the UMAP space. Each aggregated cluster contains gene expression and chromatin accessibility profiling of similar cells. Then for each gene, we compute the Pearson correlation of this expression and all its nearby sites and looking for putative enhancers that are positive, strongly positive correlated with the gene expression. From this analysis, we identify around 80,000 this regulatory element during linkages. In addition, we also search for transcription factor binding motif from this accessible site. And we compute the transcription factor expression and the transcription factor motif accessibility across these clusters and looking for this TF that shows strong correlation. From this analysis, we identify 51 putative activator that show a strong positive correlation and 90 putative repressors that show a strong negative uh, correlation. Here, I would like to show you just one example. For example, this gene DRS2 is a canonical neurogenesis marker. And we observe that, and we can see that both the gene expression, promoter accessibility, and the distal link style is enriched in the neurogenesis related cells. What's more, as the transcription factor, we observed that the gene expression and the motif accessibility is positive correlated with each other, suggesting that this transcription factor plays an uh, activated role in the neurogenesis and especially in the olfactory bulb neurogenesis. Expand, this is a known marker and we expanded analysis and identified several putative novel regulators of the newborn cell test. For example, this ZFX is enriching microglia and PLU6F1, H, and BLX1 is enriched in several immature neuron types. The other two show a transcription factor, KF8 and SMAC1, show a negative correlation and enrich in gene expression in the immature neuron breast, suggesting that they may play a repressive role 
in the adult neurogenesis. So here we comprehensively characterize the gene expression and epigenetic controls of each newborn cell type at the main cluster level. Next, we hope to zoom in into the continuous trajectory to see if we can reconstruct the molecular dynamics at a more continuous level. So we we'll first look into the neurogenesis related cells and we perform subclustering, iron velocity analysis and serial time analysis and reconstruct this uh, beautiful trajectories. Cells starting from a common ancestry and then either grow into astrocytes or grow into two neurogenesis, the digitic general neurogenesis or vector bound neurogenesis. Importantly, this in silico constructed trajectory can be validated by the time post labeling where we label cell and harvest at different time points. As you can see, as day after, as day goes on, cells tend to grow into more differentiated and end stage of this trajectory. And in the global brain cells, they are only dominated by the end stage. We identify several, uh, we, again, we identify transcription factor regulators that play important roles in the neurogenesis trajectory. So here we focus on these dentic gyro and olfactory bulk trajectories. I show you one exact, uh, several examples. For example, this bottom transcription factor are enriched in the common progenitor, while several transcription factors that are unique and specified involved in the lineage specification such as neural D1, neural D2 only upregulating digital neurogenesis, while this DR6, SP8, and SP9 is only upregulating OB neurogenesis. And this is not just validated by gene expression. We can also observe a very consistent trend and identify the putative mode of action through the multiple accessibility. For example, this mid one l is an interesting TF that show a upregulation in gene expression, but decrease in motif accessibility in both trajectory. And this is actually consistent with its role as a repressor uh, to repress non-neural genes in the neurogenesis. We also apply similar analysis to the oligodendrogenesis trajectory and this time we construct simple one unique directional route from oligodendrocyte progenitor to committed oligodendrocyte to myelin forming oligodendrocytes. And this can be also validated by time pulse labeling. And we also identified several novel transcription factors that and identify the putative mode of actions along the oligodendrogenesis trajectory, including some, this no factor as SOX5 and some novel factors that ESRAM, ESRG. So in the second part, a brief summary, we utilize both molecular layers to gain insight into the epigenetic controls and identify several key TF regulators that are involved in either determining the newborn cell type identity or involved in the lineage specification of these newborn cells. The next question I hope you answer is, what's the effect of aging on cell type specific proliferation and differentiation? So first, we check the post ratio of idiopathic cells along the aging process, and we observe a consistent decrease from young to adult to age. And this is really makes great sense, and is consistent with previous study that aging there's a global decrease of cell proliferation. However, what is not known before is the cell type specific behavior of this global proliferation decrease. So we compute the cell type specific fraction of idiopathic cells in each condition and normalize to the adult mass. As you can see, aging results in a global decrease, uh, exhibiting a deep like negative log flow change here in many different cell types. However, different cell types respond differently. For example, this dentic joint neuroblast seems to be the most susceptible cell type that was disrupted during the aging process that result in less than 18-fold decrease between age and adult. On the contrary, microglia is a very interesting cell type that this is the only cell type that show upregulation and proliferation in the age mass as well as the AD mutant mass. And we further examine this microglia expansion and we find that this actually part of those cells correspond to the disease associated microglia that Andrews just talk about and 
this style type shows a global increase and global increase in the proliferation activity. So the, the increase of proliferation, like ready to explain why we observe more cells in the age mice of this specific microglia state. After characterizing the cell specific proliferation at the main cluster level, next we zoom in to the continuous trajectory to see how does age affect cell differentiation at the continuous process. So here I would like to, to show you one example, the oligodendrogenesis trajectory. We plotted the cell from each condition on the oligodendrogenesis, oligodendrogenesis UMAP and observed that compared to the other conditions, age mice result in a loss of the committed oligodendrocyte precursor state, which suggests that aging results in the loss of cell differentiation of oligodendrocytes. And this can be validated by both RNA seq and ATAC seq and can be also validated by the easy sky brain actors that we saw a decrease of newly formed oligodendrocytes in the age brains. And we wonder why cause these changes? What is the special, what, what gene expression in the age mice that may correspond to this loss of differentiation? So we perform gene expression analysis and identify a list of genes that are related with oligodendrogenesis, including cell migration, calcium signaling, and cell cycle. And these genes are disrupted along the aging process in the oligodendrocyte progenitor state and may result in the loss of differentiation ability. Among these, I would like to highlight this interesting pathway, the sphingomyelin metabolism. So sphingomyelin is a lipid that is very important in the myelination process, and it can be synthesized from ceramides through this sphingomyelin synthesis. With this data, I will observe that this sphingomyelin synthesis show a decreased expression supported by promoter accessibility in the age mice. On the contrary, the reverse reaction, this finger myelin next, show increased expression. It's also supported by promoter accessibility in the age mice along the aging process. So suggesting that ceramide finger myelin metabolism is dysregulated in the aging and may result in the loss of differentiation ability of OPC in the age mice. In fact, Previous studies have shown that if we inhibit another finger myelinase, we can enhance the myelination during the differentiation of OPC in some other contexts. So this gene serving as punitive drug targets that can be used to restore the cell homeostasis or cell differentiation that are dysregulating the aging process. So far, I've shown you how we can use this data to understand the effect of aging on cell proliferation and differentiation. And now the first three parts all focusing on the mice. So the last question I hope to check is, can we identify these progenitor cells in the human brain as well? Good. Mm. So to answer this question, we generated a human brain data sets uh, in total around 800,000 cells using the EasySky protocol. And we ask whether tracker sky can facilitate ident identification of the rare progenitor cells in the age brains by integrating the human and the mouse data sets. Here is the integration result. And as expected, all brain cells from the mouse is overlapping, similarly overlapping well with the whole human, human brain cells. However, we observe some cells from the human brain that co-localize with the easy epoxic cell from the mice. After careful inspection, we found that this corresponds to the rare differentiating oligodendrocytes that match to the committed oligodendrocyte in the mouse and some cycling cells in the human that match to the neuronal progenitor cells in the mouse. And importantly, if, if we only perform clustering on a human alone, these rare cycling of progenitor cells are masked in the global population because they are so rare, they can mark, it's very hard to look, identify them at the main cluster level. And using the uh, newly generated style data set from TrackerSky, we can facilitate this identification and fish them out from the large pool. So we further zoom in to each of the pool. First, we look into the cycling cells 
And we found that these cyclic cells actually correspond to three cyclic cell types, microglia and OPCN sample, very, very rare erythroblast. And these cyclic cells are marked by canonical cyclic markers as well as cell test specific markers. We also identified several novel line encoding iron markers that are unique to the cyclic cells that potentially play an important role in the cell renewal in the human brain. Then we look into the oligodendrogenesis trajectory. One key feature of this human data set is that we have uh, cells from five brain regions and we find something interesting related with the region specific oligodendrogenesis. When we plot this trajectory from different regions separately, we find that uh, the cell balance shows a complete depletion of the committed oligoprecursors, although the other regions show similar ratio. Consistent with this, we found there's an increase of oligodendrocyte progenitor ratio in the cerebellum, accompanied by a decrease of mature oligodendrocyte ratio, suggesting that the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells in the cerebellum may tend to maintain at the more self-renewal state, while which tends not to differentiate much more compared to other regions. So we follow up with gene expression analysis and we identify some genes that potentially explain this specific state of the OPC in the cerebellum, including this transcription factor PAX3. This is a self renewal TF that has been reported a peripheral neural system that tends to maintain cell renewal instead of cell differentiation in the progenitor cell in the peripheral system. Finally, we construct a conserved, uh, we construct a shared oligodendrogenesis trajectory between human and mouse and we identify genes that are either conserved, dynamically regulated or unique to human and mouse in the oligodendrogenesis process. To summarize, uh, we developed this tracker sky protocol and use this to identify rare proliferating cells in the brain, identifying, identifying epigenetic regulators and investigate the effect of aging on the cell proliferation dynamics. We finally able to identify some progen rare progenitor cells and validate some of these key gene dynamics in the human brain data set. With that, I would like to say all my lab members, a special gene for the great spot and all the lab members for, for the great discussion during this project. And also thank my community members and collaborators and all the funding source. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Great, thank you so much. The, just really incredible work. Um, and also thanks, thank you, Andras, for answering um, some of these questions, uh, great questions coming up in the chat. Um, uh, one question for you, Zayu, um, how are these aged human brain tracking studies done? If the post-mortem brain, if this is post-mortem brain, how can the cells still be pro proliferating? Yeah, these are, these are post-mortem brain. This, uh... We 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 just do a like profiling because in the human we cannot do labeling, so we just try to uh find the cells that exhibit similar gene expression as those active proliferating or differentiating cells in the mice. But we they are sim they are transcription wise similar, but we don't know whether they are really proliferating or not because we don't have the like we cannot do the real tracking on the human brain. Thank you. Um, if there's any more questions, feel free to raise your hand, type them into the chat. Um, looks like, oh, we have another question here. Can we use the strength of EDU to estimate the exact pl proliferating time? Uh, yes, we can do this. We can do, we can do like, we can design a pulse labeling, like I harvest the cell, like if label the cells with either harvest at different time point and see like, and then quantify the ratio of cells a long time, use some modeling, we can estimate this. Yeah, people have done this in cell line, I think, and it's, uh, it's, it's totally doable. 
Well, great. Um, well, uh, we are just about at time here. So thank you both for your talks. And this has been a, an incredibly exciting session. Um, a reminder that the seminar has been recorded and will be available soon on YouTube and on our website, multimodalintegration.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter at segs underscore ICA or check the website for the latest announcements regarding upcoming talks and events. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining and uh, we hope to see you at our next seminar. Have a wonderful day.